Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, as Kathleen has told us. The lectionary is in Luke. It is called the Sermon on the Plain, which is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. But in Matthew's Gospel, we can tell that he was talking to people who were a bit richer. For example, in the Beatitudes, Matthew said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Or blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But it's different in Luke, and I'll share that with you in the sermon. So let us listen now for the word of God from Luke 6, verses 27 to 36. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do, those, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, let him hit the other one also. If anyone takes your coat, let him have your shirt as well. Give to everyone who asks you for something, and when someone takes what is yours, don't ask for it back. Do for others just what you want them to do for you. If you only love the people who love you, why should you receive a blessing? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you receive a blessing? Even sinners do that. And if you lend only to those from whom you hope to get it back, why should you receive a blessing? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. No, love your enemies and do good to them. Lend and expect nothing back. You will then have a great reward and you will be sons and daughters of the Most High God. For he is good to the ungrateful and the wicked. So be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Suppose that you were the preacher this morning and that you approached this text. I wonder, what would you say? As I approached it, I thought to myself, I wish Jesus wouldn't have said these things. The teachings are just way too hard. I told Kathleen and a couple of you in the fellowship room, I know why she took today off. She didn't want to preach on this text either. <laughs> but anyway, when I'm tempted to pass over a scripture, I say to myself, I think I need to deal with that. And so I'm going to try my best, and you can go home and write your own sermon if you want. For just a few moments, I want you to pretend like you are in a crowd in, in that time, in Jesus' time, that you would be, you would see the disciples all sitting kind of close around Jesus. You would be part of that larger crowd that is gathered, that the people want uh, him to heal them, to give them some words, uplifting words. You've put up with oppressive Roman rule lately, and they have treated you badly. You're barely able to provide for your own family. And the temple priests think that what you have belongs to them. So you have come here, and you want to hear someone speak that can kind of lift you up. And this is what you hear. And this occurred a few verses before ours this morning in scripture. Blessed are the poor. Not blessed are the poor in spirit, like Matthew said. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, Luke writes. And you think to yourself, yes, he knows who we are. We are poor people, and we have basic needs. And he knows that. But wait a minute, then he says, 
love your enemies. What? Love our enemies, those Roman soldiers, those tax collectors, the temple priests, the people who have power over us, we're supposed to love our enemies? Who can do that? Can you feel the acid kind of rising up in your throat as you listen to those impossible words? Now I want you to pretend that you're sitting in a sanctuary like this. And you've come just because you want to just escape the world for a while. But sitting next to you is a woman, and she has three children. And her husband has just walked out on her for a newer model. And behind you sits a man who cannot escape the abuse that he had as a child that he received. And then there's a teenager, and he sits in the back, and he says, thinks to himself, how can I get the kids to quit teasing me and making fun of me at school? And then the preacher gets up and reads the text for today. Love your enemies. Pray for those who mistreat you. And you're the preacher. What do you say? These teachings are just too hard. One way to deal with it is to decide that we don't really have any enemies, really. We can just gloss over this, and this is for other people. But maybe we ought to say those who we intensely dislike, and maybe not put the, the enemy tag on top of them those we can't get along with. Let's be honest. Haven't we all struggled with people who are on different sides of the vaccine issue or political parties? Haven't we remembered some bad treatment for ourselves or our families at times? And isn't the Russian-Ukraine kind of buildup bringing a few enemy feelings out in us? Well, Jesus is giving his followers kind of an orientation course. He has done the teaching about those who are blessed. And then he turns and says that if you're going to be a part of God's kingdom, you see, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be more than has been asked of you in the past. Well, the people he's talking to, and remember this, they are victims. They are not the perpetrators of such abuse. He is not saying to the perpetrators, oh, just go ahead and hit them on the other side, too, of your cheek. He's not saying that. He's talking to the people who have suffered. But he wants his followers to try and break the cycle of violence or of bad behavior or of hate somehow do something different that will make a difference in life. They are not to return a hit for a hit, or an insult for an insult, or gossip for gossip. They're to think about what would God do in this situation, and then try and follow that. They're not to pattern their ways after what everybody else does. They're to do something that reflects God's nature. It's tremendously difficult, but that is the way the kingdom apparently is being built. Now, we can't do this by human instinct. I mean, it's not in our nature. Fight will fight. Hate no, somehow we are to call on the merciful ways of God. That's what Jesus says. We're to lift others up, not to do what we necessarily want, but what God wants. Don't we need this response even more today than ever before? What would it happen if we all prayed for our enemies? 
or those you dislike, how different would the world be? What does this look like? Well, a man came to his pastor. He and his wife were separated and they were moving for divorce. And he came to his pastor because what irked him the most was that his wood pile was disappearing at night. So he stayed up one night to see who was taking it, and he found out it was his about-to-be ex-wife. And he was so angry that she would dare to do that. How could he get her to stop? His wise pastor said, I wonder what would happen if instead of getting angry every afternoon, you restocked her wood pile instead. Oh, okay. My friends, John and, and Marcy, were going into a popcorn store during the pandemic. And right at the door, out came a couple of women and they were so angry because the clerk refused to wait on them because they wouldn't wear a mask. And John, who was very uh, compromised immune-wise, said to them, would you wear a mask for me? Of course, they stormed off and said, absolutely not. But when we talked about it afterwards, he said, I wonder what would have happened if I would have said, I will wear a mask for you instead. It would have made a difference, maybe. It might have built something in the kingdom. And of course, this is Black History Month, and we can come up with examples there that kind of help us see how we might change our, our actions at times. But do you remember that six-year-old Ruby Bridges who had to segregate or integrate her school? And she was to get out of the car that was driven for her and walk between two lines of National Guard and straight to the, the school. She was not to stop or talk to anybody. She got halfway down and she stopped. She didn't say anything out loud, but they could see her lips moving. So when she got in school, the teacher said, what were you doing? And she said, I was praying for the hecklers and I was praying for their hurt. A six-year-old knew how to build the kingdom. Apparently, somebody had taught her what her soul needed to do. Martin Luther King, of course, had many examples for us. Uh, he spoke at, spoke at a rally against uh, or with some people that wanted blacks to obey very oppressive laws, and now they were riding up against it. And his last line was, so do to us what you will, but we will love you in any way. He was building the kingdom. John Lewis, who heard Martin Luther King speech that day, and in his younger days, he was a freedom rider. And they had many times were beaten by KKK members as they got off their buses. But anyway, um, 50 years after that, one of those people who beat him up called him and said, I want to get together and see if you will forgive me. And of course, John Lewis, he was a representative that time in Congress, said absolutely, and he did. Right now I'm taking a course in Native American history, and this example came to mind, and I know I might have shared it with some of you at one time, but just enjoy it again, because it's a true story. It's a story about Sue Ann Big Crow, who lived on Pine Ridge Reservation. She was a tremendous basketball player, and she was instrumental in getting her team to go to the state finals for the first time, a reservation team in the state finals. And the way they did it at the beginning of the game was they were gonna announce each player. They were to come out and stand in the middle of the gym, and then they would say their name from the tallest down to the shortest. Her friend was the tallest, she was second. And before she went out, the crowd was heckling 
and started saying, how, how, how? And she turned and said to Sue Ann, I cannot go out there. And Sue Ann said, I'll go. She went first. She took her jacket and she went in the middle of the gym and she did an Indian dance. And when she finished, well, before she finished, they started saying, go, go. And when she finished, there was astounding applause. That's a way to build a kingdom. I don't know. Can you and I do that? Maybe this helps us a little bit. Fred Beekner was a Presbyterian pastor, a very, very um, well-known, thought-out pastor, and this is what he says, and I share it with you. Jesus says we're to love our enemies and to pray for them, meaning love not in the emotional sense, but in, what, in the sense of willing their good. That's a tall order, even so. But you can, can we see where they really are vulnerable? For example, if we can see what is hateful about them, can we glimpse what they might have done or felt or where that hatefulness comes in them? Seeing the hurt that what, what is hateful about them, uh, seeing the hurt that they caused you, you may also see the hurt that they cause themselves. You're light years away from being able to pray for them, probably. But at least you can see that they are human, just like you're human. And that's a step in the right direction. It is possible that you can get to the point where you can pray for them just a little. Just a little, maybe if uh, that God would forgive them because you yourself can't. But any prayer for them at all is a major achievement and breakthrough. Hmm. Maybe so. Can we pray for them at all? Love your enemies. How far can we go? Soren Kierkegaard was a Protestant pastor during the uh, Nazi regime, and he was part of the resistance movement. He was, of course, arrested and killed, but he did write this. If you mean by Christian, we are to be what the Sermon on the Mount says, or the Sermon on the Plain, then in any given time in history, maybe there would be four or five people that have the right to call themselves Christian. I, I get it. I understand what he is saying. I mean, the bar is very, very high. The faithful life is very demanding. But Jesus asks his followers, even you and me, to do a lot. I'm not sure, however, I agree with him about the four or five, because I see us sitting here, and those of us that are streaming, I think we're trying. We really want to do, don't we, what God wants us to do in any situation. If we return hate for hate, what have we built? If we return hit for hit, or even love for love and skip over all those who really need our love, what have we contributed? Really, somehow with the help of our Lord, we are to find a way, find a way, and offer whatever prayer we can, however flawed it might be. Because maybe at the end of our life, the question that will be asked of us is, how have we added to the kingdom? Amen. We will now have a, a song by Rachel and